Thank you all. I sure appreciate uh, coming. So the first Sunday is crowded, and the last Sunday is sparse, but the hardcore folks are here. And, uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, so I want to uh, use the board here, if I can find the marker. Sometimes they get hidden away. At the bottom. Yeah, yeah here we go. Um, I, want, I wanted to uh, see if there's anybody in the room that remembers the cliffhanger oh. I gave you two weeks ago. Is that four organizations started in Dallas? Is that the one? Well, there's three. Three? Okay. But uh, I'll give you a hint on two of them. Two of them started in Oak Cliff. Now let me let me go back to for those of you that might not have been here. Let me go to the to the cliffhanger. What worldwide known American institutions were started in Oak Cliff, Texas? What worldwide well known everywhere organizations were started in Oak Cliff? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? It is, what do you think? Wasn't one the Dallas Baptist College? Dallas, Dallas Baptist, Baptist College, no, no. Dallas Baptist College was uh, actually started up in um, um, Graham, no, that's not right. Anyway, it was, uh, it was, it was moved here in 1967, I believe, and it's been in Dallas now 50 some years, but um, and but it, I wouldn't say that it's a world worldwide known. It, it's a well-respected school, but it's not necessarily known around the world. Anybody else want to take a shot at this? Okay. The first one is the drive-in restaurant. The drive-in restaurant. Now. Uh, it's hard, you know, we've, we're so uh, identified drive-in restaurants with America that it's hard for us to realize that until 1921 there were no drive-in restaurants. Now, the drive-in restaurant concept, um, you have to understand what it is. It's the idea of cars driving into a restaurant but instead of people going in and eating inside the restaurant, these young men, never women in the beginning, young men would come out and they would hop onto the running board and uh, therefore they were called car hops. <laughs> so these car hops, these, these car hops uh, would, uh, take an order, write it down on a little pad of paper, go back in, uh, pick up the food, bring the food out to the car. And this, oh, this uh, very first ever drive-in restaurant was in Oak Cliff at the corner of uh, Fort Worth Boulevard. It used to be the Fort Worth Pike, as in Turnpike. It used to be <coughs> uh, a road you'd have to pay to be on. And uh, then it later became probably Highway 80 and then uh, the, the Turnpike and ultimately Interstate 20 took its place. But anyway, and Chocolate <laughs> and uh, Fort Worth <coughs> Avenue, you have Pig, oh, this didn't work out real well, Pig Stand Number One. Mm -hmm. Now Pig Stand Number One in the annals of uh, fast food are really, it's really hard to, for us to appreciate today because they're just everywhere, right? If, if, um, you, if you drive your car out here, as soon as you come to a commercial area of any kind, there's going to be some kind of drive-in restaurant uh, or at least uh, fast food because what's, it, what's evolved with the pig stand is this idea of uh, the convenience of going in a car, right? So the pig stand idea was so tremendously popular. By the way, their big thing was a pig sandwich. 
so-called big sandwich, which is, you know, really a pork sandwich, of course. This is the old problem of, of German and French. Pig is German, pork is French, and they, these two, you know, are forever in conflict, all right? So, so it's really a pork sandwich. But what's ironic about this, about a pork sandwich, is that Texas didn't have pork sandwiches. See, when I first came to Texas and then made a trip, I, I was amazed by all the barbecue, but the barbecue is primarily beef barbecue, right? right. And, I, and then I was making a trip east, and as soon as I hit that Louisiana border, the next barbecue place was pork. See? And uh, I was surprised, but it makes sense historically if you think about it. The South had lots of pigs. But, but in Texas, you start to move into cattle, you see. And so uh, the cattle were, uh, beef was much more plentiful in Texas, and so you have beef barbecue. Now people argue about this to this day, you know, what's better, uh, beef, <laughs> beef or pork. I think in the area of ribs, the pork folks, the pork supporters have won. But I think in the area of uh, everything else, brisket, the uh, beef people might, might have won. Anyway. So they served this pig sandwich, and this was kind of revolutionary in the way that uh, Chick-fil-A was when it came out, you know, the first so-called chicken sandwich. Well, uh, so, so what happened is, is that um, um, in, in, the, in the building of the pig stand, it was immediately franchised. Now this is also another first. The first franchise restaurants were at the pig stand. The idea of franchising, which later you know become uh, everywhere, it was was started then out of Dallas in the pig stand. Now, pig stand number twenty one was built in uh, in Southern California. Pig stand twenty one. In other words, they they built hundreds of these, but pig stand twenty one is important because there. They had, they, had, they had the idea of putting a drive-through window, right? The drive-through window. So the drive-through window idea, which has now replaced the car hops, right? Mm -hmm. right. Uh, for those of you who came in late, you know, the idea of the original pig stand was for the, uh, the boys to run out and jump on the running boards. Remember, this is 1921, right? You're, you're primarily, the number one car in 1921 is still the Model T. And uh, many of those, probably the majority of those here, were built down in Deep Ellum at the Ford Motor uh, plant, built in 1913 by Henry Ford, so he didn't have to ship Fords to Texas, he built them here. And later became the Adams Hat Factory, and then today it's locked. But they, they, they turned, 75, as it goes north uh, from Interstate 30, they turned the highway so as to save that building. That's how important that building was. And, uh, and so today, you go, it still has the sign. So this is, this is extremely important. The man, the man who, uh, the men who started Pig Stand, one, one's named Jesse Kirby, and then Dr. Reuben Jackson, and uh, Dr. Uh, these two guys had this idea of pig stand, and they, of course, made fabulous fortune. And it was uh, uh, the pig stand has it, it, it is believed to be the first in a number of things. I'd like to give you this list: the first to serve onion rings, the first to serve chicken fried steak, the first to uh, serve Texas toast. The first to use neon lights, and then the other first, of course, is the first to be franchised. And so, you know, there's not a sign. I went out there the other day uh, to find it, to find the spot. And Chalk Hill Road has changed its route. And so basically, it's the corner of um, Fort Worth and Cockrell Hill, uh, right there next to the, uh, the old. Uh, uh, monastery uh, and, and Catholic school, Mount St. Michael. And uh, so I'm, I'm just sort of really, really eaten up 
I guess is a bad pun on this. <laughs> but I'm just so amazed by it, how important this is in American culture. And there isn't one tiny, you know how some obscure building will say, you know, Texas historical site? There's yeah. nothing like that here. Wow. See? And, and so the more important it is, the less attention it gets. I mean, this is, this is the way things go. And uh, the son of, uh, oh, by the way, one other thing Jesse Kirby did, he invented the little tray with hooks on it they used to put on, right? And uh, his son uh, went on to uh, build a place that some of you may have heard of called Kirby Steakhouse. So uh, Jesse Kirby's son, BJ, built Kirby Steakhouse. He died some years ago, but I think there's still one or two Kirby Steakhouse still left around. Anyway, um, the second uh, drive-in restaurant in the United States was out in California, in Sacramento. I think you've also heard of it. It's known as A and W. Named after the, the two guys, Roy Allen and Steve Wright, who started it down in, and then uh, and then you have Bob's Big Boys, and you, you just have a long. Line them, but probably the earliest hamburger place was White, White Castle. White Castle goes all the way back to 1960. But White Castle, if you've ever been to White, you know, we don't, why don't we have White Castles in Texas? This is always a puzzle to me. We got Whataburger. Yeah, we have Yeah, yeah we got Whataburger. Oh, right. Probably get them on Amazon now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In, in Prime Plus, and they'll have it to you in two hours. I mean, it's amazing. So, um, anyway, uh, this, you know, the evolution of the, uh, the drive in uh, restaurant is pretty astounding because it's, um, it, it just took on a life of its own. By the way, there was a very, very famous drive-in restaurant, which wasn't started in Oak Cliff, but came to Domino Oak, uh, Oak Cliff called Civils. I want to spell this so you get this right. S-I-V-I-L apostrophe S. Civils. Now, Civils was famous. It was at the corner of Fort Worth Avenue and Davis, where those two come together was a big triangle. And there, they had a, a restaurant, driving restaurant for 500 cars. Oh, wow. And they had 100 female car hops. Now, in order to be hired at Civils, uh, you had to be, this is so, bad nowadays to say this, but you had to be a looker. No, the steaks came later. But you, you had to be a looker and not a hooker, right? Um, by the way, the word hooker uh, comes okay. from, anybody know where the word hooker comes from? General. Yes, General Hooker. His, his, his uh, folks were, he sort of looked turned a blind eye to the fact that his men were hiring prostitutes. And uh, so his regiment became famous for having a lot of prostitutes. And because he was in command, they called him hookers. And, uh, and that, that word, of course, does survive to this day. Well, anyway, we have, we have a former patron of civil standing in the front row here, sitting in the front row of oh, our yeah. good friend Sam. Do you want us to raise you, hands? Or can you just tell, can you just stand up so they can hear you? Tell them just a, just what civil seemed like. He was a, I guess a kid, right? I can I can only tell you what I've heard. Civils <laughs> <laughs> was really an institution, but and there was there were many reasons for it being located where it was located. There were huge nightclubs on uh, Jefferson or Davis, I'm not sure which. Red Devil was one. Uh, there was there were several of them. You could go to Sybil's, you could always get a date to go to the nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> and people crowded around. I mean, it was it really was an institution. Carol and I moved to uh, Virginia back in 1988. One of the first people I met out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, my boss's wife, her first question of me was, did you ever go to Sybil's? <laughs> 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 uh, she'd never been to Dallas, but she knew Sybil's. 
Um, right. Thanks, Sam. You, I had the same experience. When I came to Dallas, I was teaching, and still am, in Oak Cliff and Mount View College, and uh, any number of people would uh, mention Sybils, because it was quite an institution. By the way, what was the name of the nightclub you went to? Red Devil was one. The only one I can remember. The Along Fort with Avenue? Uh, no, that was Pappy Showland. Oh, yes. Happy show. Yeah, happy Boy, you got you got to really go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's only what I've heard. <laughs> yeah. Your mom would have known Happy Showland. It was it was very well known uh, and popular until Oak Cliff went dry. I think that ended Happy oh, Showland. That ended a lot of. A what lot year of did they go dry? Um. Sam, do you know it's it's in the it's, it held on for a long time. Thirties people were were pretty well uh, accustomed to carrying their alcohol with them. Yeah. 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 You carried a bottle, you drank every bit of it, you went home. You know, if you're lucky. But it was um, it, it, that was in the Maybe I, I don't know, but it was it, it's been dry all my life. It's been Not dry all my life. Yeah, my yeah. Life. yeah. Life. yeah. I'm, I'm just curious if women. you knew about that. I know the Baptists were behind it. Well, it, you know, uh, Dallas. Well, the, the 19th Amendment, uh, 1920, I think. Anyway, did a prohibition came in the 20s. But but I think I think you're right about this. People just were very much in the habit of coming to these places. And, and bringing their own booze in. But that's why, of course, Top of the Hill, uh, where uh, Jimmy and I, Janet, and uh, others have visited Top of the Hill Casino in Arlington because they were serving it there, but that was essentially what they called in Chicago a speakeasy. Uh, you had to have you had to have passwords to get in, and then they, they had everything there. They had gambling, they had prostitution, they had it all. and. Uh, so Top of the Hill Casino is very, very famous. But Pappy Showland, I think, was more of the kind of place where you would, uh, you would take uh, your booze and uh, they, would look, they would look the other way. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway. Yeah, they, you know, today they would charge car or something if you go in with your own bottle. There they did. It was just, they charged extra for a Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even 50 cents. Yeah, wow. Um, I can't pass drive-in restaurants without mentioning McDonald's, of course, which has become the preeminent world-famous drive-in. started, of course, in 1940 with McDonald's Brothers as a barbecue place. This has really surprised me. They were, they were trying to imitate, with a bigger menu, a pig stand, you see. And, uh, but, but they uh, hired, they hired a lot of, um, of car hops, and females, and so on. But one day in the 40s, right after the war, they decided that it's costing them too much, and so they decided to streamline the operation. So they, they cut the menu from 25 down to about five items. And, uh, and I can, can remember this very well as a kid going into uh, McDonald's. Um, the, the, the menu was hamburgers, cheeseburgers, potato chips, no fries then, coffee, soft drinks, and apple pie. That was it. That was the whole. That was the whole menu, and the the hamburgers were fifteen, and the <laughs> the drinks were ten, and the shakes were I think fifteen, and so forth. Since. Yeah. 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 Times have changed. So anyway, uh, a guy, a, a traveling salesman by the name of Ray Kroc, in 1929, he he was selling um, paper cups, and he taught Walgreens nationwide into using to-go cups because they, they in those days they still had soda uh, what do you call them? Um, yeah, fountain, soda fountains, fountain. soda fountains. Okay. and uh, they doubled their sales and so Ray Kroc uh, made lots and lots of money well in the 1940s he had visited the McDonald brothers in San Bernardino California and, and was crazy about their operation and he asked them if they would franchise, and they said, well, they'd, they'd already franchised in Arizona and in California, but they, they, didn't, they didn't think the thing would go over in cold climates. They didn't think driving restaurants go over in cold climates. Nobody ever tried this. 
So Christ said, well, will you give me rights to the rest of the nation? And I'll pay you, I'll pay you 0.5% of gross sales. Now that doesn't sound like much, right? If you, but you realize what McDonald's does uh, in, in a year. Well, anyway, uh, so he, he got that and in the Plains, Illinois, he opened the first McDonald's in 1955. And, uh, and of course, he immediately, it was a huge hit. And the, the McDonald's got rich, he got rich, everybody got rich. And, uh, but he had rights to the franchise, see, so, so eventually, in the McDonald's, parted ways, and he bought them out. He paid them an enormous amount of money and, and bought them out. And then, of course, spread worldwide over however many years. And uh, the, the, thing, the thing to remember, the interesting thing to remember about Ray Kroc is, is that he, I don't think, surprises anyone of the huge success of this thing. Now, I grew up in the Black Hills of South Dakota, about as isolated as you could get. And yet in 1957, I walked into a McDonald's <coughs> in, um, in the Black Hills. And, uh, and of course, I marveled, as everybody else did, at the prices. <coughs> For 25 cents, you could have a meal. And, uh, and then, you know, if you had a little bit more, you could have a shake. And 25 cents was my allowance, you know, for a week. So that seemed like an enormous deal to me. Now, later it occurred to me, how in the world was a franchise way out there in South Dakota just two years after Croc had, had, had um, opened the very first one? And so I investigated and found out. Ray Croc... Um, got involved with a woman and who divorced him, uh, her husband to marry him. She was from Rapid City, South Dakota. And so, so Ray Crowley <coughs> gave the husband a franchise oh. as a pair. It was worth a fortune, of course. And, uh, and uh, so that's why I, as a kid, walked into a McDonald's before hardly anybody in the country had been in McDonald's. Of course, you know, they spread everywhere. By the way, that Mrs. Croc uh, from Rap City, South Dakota, is when he, when he died, she got it all. And you know where most of the money went? Right. Salvation Army. Oh, good for her. And then also, she, other the things she supported was National Public Radio. So you'll often hear her name mentioned uh, as uh, supporting that. But... She became a great philanthropist and uh, quite astonishing uh, what the, the good she did with the money. Ray Kroc, you know, he, could, he, he, he didn't care anything about that. Now, I want to get to the second... <laughs> Man, we get bogged up. Wait, uh, I want to get to the second great iconic institution known worldwide that also started Oak Cliff very near where the pig stand stood. Does anybody want to take a shot at this one? 7-Eleven? Yes. Yes, David. 7-Eleven. The world's first convenience store. Now, you have to hear this story. There was a man named Joe Thompson. Now, Joe Thompson... Um, Joe Thompson was... worked for... Uh, or was running a company, a very small little ice company, called Southland Ice Company. Now, the word Southland is very big to us now, you know, Southland Corporation and all that. When I first came to Dallas, there was the Southland building downtown, and if you wanted to impress a date, you would take her to the uh, ports of call at the top of the Southland building, right? Well, anyway, Southland Ice Company was just one of many, many ice companies in this area. And... Uh, Joe Thompson had a, there was a man that worked for him at one of the docks. They had the, the plant where they made all the ice, these huge blocks of ice. But they had to have docks where they sell them to the public. So one of those docks was the corner of 12th and Edgefield. 12th and Edgefield. Very close to where Brian and Robin lived. 
And um, so 12th and Edgefield, there was a dock. And that dock, uh, people would come and get, every day, would come and get blocks of ice. They also had people that delivered ice, right? But uh, they didn't deliver on Sunday, so their biggest day was Sunday. And the only business open in Oak Cliff, with the possible exception of a pharmacy, was Southland Ice Company, right? And people would come, and this Joe Green, a uh, friend of Thompson, worked there. He suggests, he said, people keep asking me, why don't we carry some basic items like bread and eggs and milk? Because, remember, Oak Cliff was completely under the domination of Blue Laws. Yeah. Now, Blue Laws, of course, start back with John Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, and spread to America through the Puritans, who were all Calvinists, and then one of the great derivative, or I should say two of the great derivative organizations, denominations came out of the Puritans, were the Baptists and the Churches of Christ. And I would say North Texas was dominated by Baptists and Churches of Christ, and Christians, Disciples of Christ, who were the same, basically, originally the same thing. So, what, what happened is, um, and I've told this story, so I'm, I apologize if you've heard it before, but in 1970, I came to Dallas in my little Volkswagen Beetle to teach at the community college here, and uh, I knew no one in Texas, and I knew where nothing was, or how anything worked, and so forth. But anyway, I got a garage apartment in Oak Cliff, and, uh, that was on Saturday, and on Sunday I went to the uh, lady who lived in the house where the, where the garage was, and I said, uh, do, you, do you have any, um, any nails? I'd like to put some things up in my little apartment, some of my things. Everything I owned was in the back of a Volkswagen. You can imagine <laughs> how, how much motors had changed. Yeah, those were the those were yeah. the days, right? Simple, simplest. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, she said, "Yeah, yeah, I think so." Go down Conquer Hill Road, tell the dead ends in Dunkerville, and go to Skaggs Albertsons. Yeah. Now, yeah. Skaggs Albertsons, Skaggs and Albertsons were two Boise. Idaho Mormons who had gotten together to fuse uh, uh, the idea of a pharmacy with a grocery store. I mean, this was revolutionary at the time. <coughs> and she said, you know, they might have them down there. And she said, I don't know if you can buy them. I didn't know, you know. <laughs> a lot of times people think, say things to you and you kind of go, hmm. And, but you don't follow it up on it. So I, 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 I went down my little Volkswagen and I got down to Skaggs Albertsons. And I went in and uh, asked somebody, I said, uh, do you have any hardware here? And yeah, yeah, back in the corner, you'll find it. So when I got back there, uh, I was sort of shocked because the whole section was covered up with plastic. Right. And so I wondered, this is, Sunday is an odd day to be painting. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and so finally uh, somebody came by and I said, excuse me, um, I need some nails. And I, their nails are there, but I can't, you know, they're on those plants, I can't quite get to them. And, he, he, and I said, can I get some nails? And instead of saying, you know, yes or no, he said, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, not from here. <laughs> and he said, have you ever heard of Blue Laws? <clears throat> oh, yeah, I have. See, the long arm of John Calvin from 1540 had reached out and touched me in 1970 in Dunkville, Texas. And yeah, I think I have heard of Blue Laws. Well, you know, in Texas, everything you can't, is closed and there are many things you can't buy on a Sunday. We're open because of the pharmacies here. Oh, I get it. But we can't sell a lot of things. We can sell food items and we can sell food. Uh, medicine, but that's about it. And I, she, he said, there is a, a funny loophole here. He said, you can buy the hammer, but you can't buy the nail. <laughs> Where's the logic in that? <laughs> or, 
you can go down to Keene, Texas. Keene, Texas, Seventh-day Adventist city down on 67, town, village, you know, big center of the Seventh-day Adventist. So down there, everything's open. The post office is open, everything. I said, oh yeah, because their holy day is Saturday. Hmm. So anyway, uh, I was, so just, I marveled at this whole business of the blue laws. Well, this is why 7-Eleven took off. Because of blue laws, this Joe Thompson could sell a few items well, he's selling ice. And boy, this became a hit, and it became very popular. Because, see, a lot of times people needed, uh, people that were on a regular delivery route still needed ice on a Sunday, but there was no delivery, you see. So they'd come down to the dock at 12th and uh, Edgefield and pick up some ice and then pick up some milk and eggs and so forth, right? So this was a huge hit. So they decided to change the name to Totem. Like you Totem, you tote things, right? Yeah. And that was there for a while, but eventually they wanted to emphasize their hours, how their hours were so extensive from 7, my goodness, to 11. Nothing was open like that. Now I think they're, what, 24 hours, a lot of them? But you know, times have really changed since all this happened uh, in 1927. And so that's uh, Joe Thompson, of course, made a great fortune. He also started Oak Farm Dairies. Oak Farm Dairies. And Oak Farm Dairies is, uh, became the largest dairy in Dallas, and then one of the largest dairies in the world, because they would supply all the 7-Elevens. By, by the way, the site of Oak Farm Dairy is being considered, of course, by the Amazon people as one of the possible sites, because the, the plant is now closed. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's on, it's, they have a, a trolley now, it was the downtown, and it's not far from the Dart Line. And I mean, there's some some of the things that uh, Amazon wants for their second headquarters fits the bill. That's a strange thing. I was giving this talk a week ago last Friday, and uh, afterwards, a lady came up to me, who was a secretary I know from Mountain View, and she said, you're not going to believe this. People do this to me all the time. They come up and say, you're not going to believe this. Okay, hit me. <laughs> my sister is married to Michael Thompson. You're kidding. The grandson of Joe Thompson. Yeah. He said, oh yeah, they're millionaires, billionaires, but he said, they're just such nice, ordinary people. You know, they don't live in real fancy place and they just live a kind of ordinary life. And she said, uh, but she said, never really hit me until you gave this talk. You know, the, the historical significance of all this. Right. So, 7-Eleven uh, uh, is uh, 10,000 outlets worldwide. It's, by the way, owned by a Japanese firm. Now, why would a Japanese firm be interested in owning 7-Eleven? Answer. More than one-third of all 7-Elevens are in Japan. They love 7-Eleven. I have no idea why exactly, but they do. And uh, so, again, this is one of the many puzzles <clears throat> why the Japanese, you know, after World War II, they went from being so antagonistic toward American culture to just totally embracing American culture, right? So you can go to Japan, hear country and western music, you can, you know, they'd already were playing baseball, but they played more baseball, and then eventually, uh, you know, anything with